I said it was what? All right. <laughs> That's not much of a costume. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so congratulations to you all for coming to class. Um, I don't know. I really think if if you want to benefit your fellow students, you might tell them that they really should come because Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna summarize what, what this guy Niels Bohr, oh, did for the uh, hydrogen atom. Oh, I downloaded a picture of him from uh, the movie, the Oppenheimer movie. <laughs> I had a, I had, actually, I, I don't know if I could find it, but uh, maybe this was it. <laughs> Can find his picture. No, it's not in there. Uh, hmm. Maybe it's in here. Everyone was very glad to see him when he showed up, if I remember in the movie. Yeah, so this shows <laughs> Kevin Brana playing the part and uh, what he really looked like on the right, which to me doesn't look a thing like him. But... Anyway, there you go. So. We have a movie reference for our chemistry and that didn't show up online because I didn't share the screen, but that's okay. Who cares? <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, this guy, Niels Bohr, did a lot of work on the hydrogen atom and he came up, I'm going to just go over uh, just like the conclusions that he came to that he found. So he came up with this idea that you have certain states or a certain radii of orbits, certain states or radii. What do I mean by certain radii of orbits? Yeah, if this is the nucleus, it means that you have one, maybe an orbit here. And I'm not going to draw the whole thing, but I mean the whole thing. You have an orbit at this radius and you have an orbit at this radius, et cetera. He called these states, actually, he called them stationary states. I didn't tell you that last time, but that's what they're called, stationary states. And that electron in the hydrogen atom, it could be in, in one of these states. And if it was in one, it would stay in one unless a photon of the right energy came along to excite it to another state. Okay. Um, so that was one of the conclusions that that a well, couple other conclusions. So, so they can electron an electron can only move from one stationary state or orbit to another with absorption or emission of exactly the correct energy. And that would be the energy difference between the two states. Now, we uh, so, so this is also presumes that electrons can only have certain energies corresponding to these radii. So each of these states has an energy, has its own energy. So we have this state with n equals one. Use the number n to sort of number to to um, 
keep track of these states, I guess. And then N equals two, and they start to get closer together. Like that, okay? And each one has an energy. This would be E1, E2, E3. And he went even further. He figured out the value of those energies would be proportional to one over the square of N, which is why you have the weird spacings. And he even figured out what this constant would be. So that you could put in the value of N for any one of those states and solve for the energy of that state. Okay, so if you put a one in here for N squared, you would be multiplying just by one over one squared, which is one you would find that E1 would be minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. E2 would be minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules times one over two squared or one fourth and et cetera. So you could figure out the energy of all the states this way. Now, sorry, yes, it's not called anything. <laughs> Well, different books call it different things. Some call it RH, some call it, he, they call it K, it doesn't matter. Um, and another thing that he did was he, he took the um, evidence from line spectra. Remember what a line spectrum is, is when you excite hydrogen atoms with electrical energy or by burning them with a huge amount of heat, Electrons get go from lower levels, a lower level here, let's say, to an upper level like this level. And but they don't stay there. They emit a photon. They go from a higher energy to a lower energy state. And there were three transitions in the hydrogen atom, these three different lines here, let me call them one, two, and three. One was a violet line, 434 nanometers was the wavelength. Transition two was a sort of a blue-green line. And it was at, oh, I forgot. I don't have the, I think it's like four, uh, what did, uh, okay, I'm gonna look it up. How could I forget such a thing? 486, that's what I was going to say. But anyway, whatever. 486 nanometers. And number three was at 657 nanometers. So these are three different wavelengths for three different emission transitions in hydrogen. And, um, and you know how delta E is H nu, nu is the frequency, or HC over lambda. So he figured out what the delta E should be for these three different transitions based on the wavelength, and it exactly matched what he got from his formula. So this is a formula for the energy of the nth level. You could find the energy of a transition by taking the energy of the final minus the energy of the initial, and you get this equation. It's just one over NF squared minus one over NI squared in the parentheses. And when he used, when he used this formula and plugged in the values here, so we have, you know, whatever these N values were, this was basically for, n equals five to n equals two, n equals four to n equals two, n equals three to n equals two. These are the three transitions, oops, okay? And he plugged in this being the initial n and this being the final n. He got, um, he, he, he used the wavelength to calculate a delta E. It exactly equaled the delta E in the atom with one little modification, and that is you have to take the absolute value here because if it's emission, it'll be negative and you don't have negative wavelengths. So I gave you, th this would be the energy of the photon. 
Okay, so we talked about that last time as well. And I wanna tell you there's a special problem. If you take the handouts I gave out last, I don't know when I gave them out, but the one with the waves on the back, it's problems three, four, and five of activity one. Number three is just like the example that I did last time for uh, an n equals five to n equals two transition. This is an n equals two to n equals one transition. And um, these three, I'll give you three special problem points for doing them and I'll collect that after the exam. So SP activity one, three, four, and five, three points. And it'll be due Thursday, whatever the Thursday is, a week from today. November 9th, okay? And you should do that, it'd be good for you. <laughs> All right, so Bohr did a lot, you know? He came up with this formula, it gave the right energy, it agreed with the wavelengths that they saw. Um, so does this end the story <laughs> for um, electrons and atoms? I mean, does it even end the hydrogen and atom story? And, and the answer is that it does not, okay? <laughs> this is really only the beginning of the story. Um, and in fact, uh, gosh, are we even recording anymore? I don't even know. Uh, looks like we are, good. Um, okay, so, and in fact, there were a lot of problems. And the first problem was that, so, so I'm just gonna say, so, so are we done with atoms? And the answer is no. <laughs> because there's a lot of problems. Are we done with the uh, energies of electrons in atoms? No. Because when they try to apply this same theory to helium even, I mean, helium only has two electrons. So I would say that the first problem was that they could not even apply this theory to the next element up, helium. They could not explain the lines in the helium atom spectrum like they could hydrogen, okay? So it only worked for hydrogen and that's really not too good because <laughs> that's only the uh, atom with one electron. The second thing was that there was, I'm gonna call it the weird, some weird experimental results were, uh, were found for the nature. What is the nature of electrons? So this is about, the, I'm gonna call it the nature of electrons. Um, and, and this really gave scientists pause. They didn't know how to explain these results. I'm gonna go over that next. But, and this one is almost the worst of all the three, is that the assumption of these stationary states that these, these orbits that electrons couldn't get out of um, just because Bohr said so, you know, that kind of came out of thin air. There was really no exper no theoretical basis for why an electron would be stuck in a state and could only get out if it absorbed or emitted a photon. Okay, so there's really no theoretical basis for the idea of stationary states or stationary orbits. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about this one and then I'll work my way into the rest of it. Um, so let me look at, 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 this, at this number two, these weird results. So this was the experiment that gave the weird results. <laughs> And what they did was they took a beam of electrons and hit it and put it into, let's see if I can draw, uh, not much of a drawing, but they sent it into a crystal of nickel atoms. So these are all like nickel atoms lined up in a row in this crystal. So a nickel crystal. And it's what they saw on the other side that really was very perplexing, was really uh, hard to understand. But I'm not gonna go over those experimental results because it's really too hard. Instead, I'm gonna show you this. This is sort of a simplified 
version of that experiment with the nickel crystal, but it has a similar conclusion. So this is, if you look at, look at what you have here, this brown surface here has two slits. So you have a slit here and a slit here, okay? Now, if you took a beam of particles and you spray them on this side so that they're all going in this direction and they go through these two slits, the particles that would get through would be the ones that entered this slit here. That's what you would think, that the only particles that you would see at a distance would be the ones that made it through that slit. So they would be just in these two lines here. You would see these spots representing electrons. So that's what they thought they were going to see on the other side of the nickel crystal. And that's not what they saw at all. What they saw was a series of light and dark lines. And that made them think, what would make a bunch of lines like this? And the only thing that could make a pattern like this would be if what was coming through here was waves instead of particles of electrons, okay? So this is what we call a diffraction pattern. And I showed you this last time, remember when I talked about two slits and how in the distance, when you have a light wave, you'll see light and dark and light and dark because you'll see light where the crests line up. You'll see dark where the crest lines up with the trough of the light wave. And, and so what they spotted, they recognized to be a diffraction pattern. And this can only happen for waves. So it led them to this really crazy conclusion it led them to a, the conclusion that electrons have wave-like properties. That in this situation, electrons are waves, which, you know, that's really a very different thing from a particle and is really a very a kind of astounding conclusion. But let's think about what's ha what happened so far. Because I talked to you about the photoelectric effect. Okay. And in the photoelectric effect, it came out, one of the conclusions was that light has particle-like properties. In fact, we even gave a word, a name to a particle of light. What, what was that name that we came up with? Photons. So light has particle-like properties. And now we are seeing through that crazy experiment that electrons, which are which we thought were particles, have wave-like properties. And so this is the beginning of what we call the particle wave duality which is central to the quantum theory, which is the new theory that really had to be used to explain these results and explain how electrons exist in atoms. Okay, so, so this, is, this is crazy. How can an electron be a wave? So I would like to just address the question for a, a while, you know, how can an electron be a wave if an electron is associated with an atom, okay? What, what do waves do? Do waves stay in the same place? No, they, you know, wave, it's going, it goes. It starts here, it goes here, it ends up over there. So if an electron is a wave, how is it gonna be that it can stay with an atom? You know, so that's the first problem, okay? How can an electron be a wave? Will the electron move away from the atom? So there's really a lot of questions here that are kind of perplexing. So scientists started to think about what type of wave an electron would have to be. 
Okay, so we need a wave that stays put, <laughs> that stays in place. Does anyone here play the guitar? Okay, so what happens when you pluck a guitar string? So here's your guitar string, right? And you pluck a guitar string. Now the guitar string is fixed on two ends here. And when you pluck a string, there's a few different things that can happen. I'm gonna exaggerate the distance between the string and the, and the um, I don't know what you call it on the guitar, the neck, I guess. So you pluck the guitar string. One thing that can happen is, is you have, it goes boing. So really what, what happened there? <laughs> You have this thing that goes up and down. Is that the only thing that can happen with a guitar string? Somebody, what, what about this? What are these called? You can have this happening. Where you get the boinging over here and over here. Anybody know what this is called? Ever heard of harmonics? So these are the different, these, these are, so basically what we have here for how, so how does this form for, well, okay, so let me. So this type of wave is what happens when you have some restriction like here you have a fixed string on two ends okay and and when you pluck that guitar string what happens is, is that this traveling wave starts it goes starts here you know and it and it and it and it's a wave and it and then when it hits the other end right it hits the it hits where the string is attached on the other end it can't can't go any further so it reflects back and you get a wave traveling in the opposite direction. Now, that wave is going to interfere with the first wave. And where they're both cresting, you'll get addition. And where one is cresting, the forward wave and the reverse wave, right? Where one is cresting and one is not cresting, right? It's in the bottom, then you'll get cancellation. And you, and, and you have to ask yourself, what waves will survive? What are the only waves that will survive in a situation like this where you have this cancellation? And the answer is the ones that fit perfectly into this distance apart here, right? So you'd have the one where you have a half a wavelength here. And then you have the one where you have a whole wavelength. So in other words, a wave that, ha that has a wavelength that's like this, when it hits the string and reflects back, it's going to cancel itself out partially. All right, so I'm gonna show you a little video here that, that does this. It takes a traveling wave going this way and a traveling wave that goes this way. And it does this interference between the two waves. And then you see that what you end up with is a wave that just gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller, like a guitar string that you pluck, like it's like, like like the drawings I've drawn here. So let me see if I can can do this. Oh, by the way, here's another nice picture. I like this picture. This is showing if you put two balls like in the water and bounce them, that you will get the waves interfering with each other and at a distance, so you could see where the crests are lining up, you get, well, if you get that pattern of light and dark where they're adding and subtracting, you see that? Yes, okay, good. Well, this is what I wanted to show you. Where is it? Here, two traveling waves coming at each other, and now they start interfering. And eventually, 
Well, it just started it again. I want to get rid of that. <laughs> Here's your interference. Things cancel, things add. And finally, you end up with a wave that doesn't look like it's going left or right at all. Right? That is a standing wave. And that's what you get when you plug a string. Okay? And the reason why you, uh, the reason for the standing wave is because of the restriction on the two ends. And so you could see that there are some spots in this wave where it's always zero. Like, see where my pen is here. It's never big. It's always zero. Those are called nodes. So if I go back to my, um, uh, go back to this. This is called a node. These are called nodes. And as you have, when you have higher order harmonics here, these are called harmonics, you have more nodes. And this is characteristic of of waves that do this sort of thing. Now, that's that's a one dimensional picture right, of a wave, a standing wave. But I'm gonna show you another video. And this is showing you a two-dimensional um, standing wave. And uh, us geeks, when we drink our coffee out of a styrofoam cup, we like to make these waves because they're fun, fun to look at. And you could do it the next time you have coffee in a styrofoam cup. I think it's very hard to do if you don't have a styrofoam cup. <laughs> if it's a regular cup, I give up. <laughs> see that and now this type this so you could see that you could see some places that are always positive and some places well it's not a perfect standing wave because it is moving a little bit but it's, yeah that's it I mean it's the best you could do with a styrofoam cup you know <laughs> yeah or why does it happen Right, you can actually make it much better if you use a ring and and you know vibrate it, and you can change the frequency, and you can, and the wave can't get beyond the boundary. The boundary is a restriction, and so the waves have to be zero at the boundary, and so they form. You know, you got waves going this way, and then waves coming back and combining with it, and constructive and destructive interference, and that's what it. And it's only certain waves that will fit, the ones that have like the wavelength that exactly fits into that. But there's there's a lot more involved than that. So yeah, you have to. It has to be like not too smooth and not too rough. <laughs> you know, it has to be. Try it. Try, take that thing off and try it with your cup. <laughs> oh, that's not a styrofoam cup, though. Yeah. Oh well. All right. <laughs> so anyway, so um, let's see. So that's the 2D. All right. So in general, so standing waves. Um, are created when there's some kind of restriction. To the wave, like, for example, the guitar string is fixed on two ends. The coffee cup, the coffee in the cup has a boundary, right? So what about electrons in an atom? Electrons are attracted to the nucleus, so they can't just go anywhere. So they're restricted too. So this is the guitar string, I would say, is like a one dimensional picture of a standing wave. Coffee in a cup is a two dimensional picture, but electron in an atom is actually three dimensional. Um, so how can we picture a three dimensional wave? So that's one thing that we have to deal with, with picturing what is going on with electrons and atoms. And the other thing is how did scientists come up with the real solution to hydrogen, which is really much more complicated and, and it can be applied to other atoms as well. And um, so the answer to that question is really beyond the scope. So I'm just gonna throw out a short sort of 
um, summary of, of, of where it really came from. And so this is a field that I think I used already this word, quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics was being discovered in the early 1900s. Um, and it involves solving a famous equation. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Schrodinger. The Schrodinger wave equation. Okay. And it's not a normal equation. It's not a regular equation like, you know, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. It's a differential equation. It involves calculus and all this kind of stuff. And it's way beyond the scope of our course. But I just want to say that solutions to this equation led to <laughs> something we call wave functions which a lot of times you'll see the Greek letter psi used for a wave function, but a wave function is the same as the thing we call orbitals, okay? And these are like, these are the 3D sort of waves of electrons in atoms. And these are kind of places where the electrons can be, they're visualized, places where the electrons can be, they're really more like probability distributions. So they're giving you an idea of where the electron might most likely be found, okay? Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty about the position of an electron. So we, we kind of call these things electron clouds more than um, orbits. They're really not orbits, okay? Now, each of these wave functions or orbitals has an energy, okay? And it actually turns out that this energy is the same as what Bohr found that En equals minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules, one over N squared is still, it still works in the quantum theory. So each has a corresponding energy. And also in this model, we have three quantum numbers. Oh, so we're already uh, familiar with N but there's going to be an L and then another one, which we call M with a little L subscript. The N um, we're sort of familiar with already, but the other two we're not. And so if you look at this handout, now this handout is so such an important one. <laughs> it's on the top of this sheet. It's also on the back of your other handout. <laughs> there's two of them, so you can mark it all up and you'll have another one. And the first thing I wanna do I know this is very small on here, but and there's a lot on it. But what I want to do is look at the overview of these orbitals first. So let's kind of look at this whole thing. And what it's broken down into is the shells. So this is what's in the first shell, the n equals one shell. And then here, this is the n equals two shell. And finally, over here, we have the n equals three shell. And that's enough for us um, for now. Um, and, and so what I want to do is point out certain things, OK? So first of all, we have this nice looking kind of, well, I'll just enlarge it for a sec, right? We have this looks kind of spherical. We have this round looking orbital. This is the n equals in the n equals one shell. And as you go from the first to the second to the third shell, what happens is you have a, a spherical orbital that gets, gets larger, okay? You could see that this one is larger and this is even larger, okay? So that's the first thing to notice. And why would that be? Well, the lowest energy for an electron is to be close to the nucleus. 
this would be a higher energy. Okay, whenever you have an attraction, you stabilize something. This is more stable than this. So as you go from a smaller orbital where the electron spends most of its time closer to the nucleus, to this one, to this one, okay? The electron is further away from the nucleus and the energy is higher, okay? So that's the first thing to notice from here. What's another thing you notice between going from the first shell, the N equals one shell to the N equals two shell? There's something else there, right? So the, these are three orbitals that are not in the first shell. So every time you add a shell, you add a different shape of orbital. So the first shell only has a spherical orbital. The second shell has the spherical orbital, but larger. And then it has a different shape added. Okay, and now when we go to the n equals three shell, we have the spherical. This is, I call this a dumbbell shape. We have the dumbbell shape one here. And then we add one with even more lobes, a more complex shape. Okay, so the first shell, we have just the spherical orbital. It gets larger. Let me let me uh, kind of go down here and I'll kind of draw this, okay? We have our N equals one, our little spherical shell, spherical. Then for the N equals two, we have a larger sphere, but now we have also three dumbbell shaped orbitals, okay? For the n equals three, we have a larger sphere. We have three larger dumbbells. <laughs> and we also have five, I'm not gonna draw them all. Of a different shape, okay? so. You can see what's what's happening here is that as n increases, you get more and more complexity to where the electron can be in different orbitals. Um, and and uh, and these quantum numbers can actually help us to sort of keep track of what's going on. Okay, so I've told you about the n quantum number. That tells you the energy, that tells you the size of the orbital. So N gives energy and size. As N increases, the energy increases. All right, now we have a shape quantum number as well. So the shape of the orbital is given by another quantum number we call L. Okay, so L equals zero is a spherical orbital. So the nickname for L equals zero is S. Yeah, actually S doesn't stand for spherical, but you can think that it does. I don't really know what it stands for. It's some other language, right? So when you have an S orbital, that means L equals zero. So in the N equals one shell, there is only that one spherical orbital. L is zero. We call this orbital, this little sphere, we call it the one S orbital. The one, the first thing is the N quantum number, N equals one. The S tells you that L equals zero. So in the N equals one shell, there is only one orbital and it is the one S, okay? So now let's go to the N equals two shell. So it also has a spherical orbital 
and and l equals and we and we say that l equals l equals zero duh so this is the 2s n equals one l equals zero okay so we have a 2s orbital for n equals three we also have a spherical orbital okay so that's that's the value l equals zero yeah no it's two you got me there <laughs> all right so here yeah n equals three and l equals zero okay so now let's talk about l equals one okay so for n equals one there is no L equals one orbital. There's no P orbital. L equals one is a P type orbital. It's not, it should be maybe D for dumbbell, but it's not. So there, there's nothing for, so the N equals one shell has only one spherical orbital. We say it has only one subshell. <laughs> L indicates the subshell. So n equals one has only the s subshell. Okay, what about n equals two? Okay, we have l equals one, and those are these three dumbbell shaped orbitals, which point along the different directions of the axes, the x, y, z. So this would be z to be x this is y so we call this pz px and py so this would be the 2pz because that's n equals 2 p for l equals 1 but we call them all the 2 this is the 2p subshell of the n equals 1 shell okay there's also the 2s subshell right which i drew earlier okay i'll go back to the big chart after i i do some of this now for n equals three we also have three orbitals but they're bigger as you because as you go up all the orbitals increase in size So this would be 3p, 3px, 3py, and 3pz. Z is always pointing up. You're not going to be, you're not, yeah, it's not that important to know which is which. So, so you could see you have larger orbitals because it's the n equals 3 shell. They're further from the nucleus. So they're higher energy than the 2p. Okay, <laughs> so, um, okay, so now we have a third quantum number, which has to do with which orientation of orbital we're talking about. Okay, so um, this third quantum number is called M with an L subscript, okay? Let me just say that M sub L can have values. It starts with negative L and, add, and then keeps adding one, so negative L plus one until you get to plus L, which sounds really complicated, but let's say L equals zero, <laughs> okay? M sub L, is negative zero, which is zero. So there's only one of them. 
the number of M sub L values tells you the number of orbitals in that subshell. So M equals zero, there's only one M sub L. So there's only one um, S orbital. Any um, shell can only have one S orbital. That's spherical orbital, that's it. If L equals one, then M sub L, okay, let's start with negative one, add one, zero, add another one, one. So that's going from negative L to L. There are three orbitals. So there are three P-type orbitals in a subshell, in the P-subshell, okay? And we've seen them, one the one up side and the other direction, a three different directions of the X, Y, X, Y, Z axes. L equals two, M sub L equals, okay. So we start with negative L. What's negative L gonna be here? Negative, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. So there are five orbitals. So there are five D orbitals in the D subshell. So now if I go back to that paper that I gave you, that diagram, see if I can grab that again. I'm going to make another copy of it. Okay, so we have this again, and now maybe we could see the pattern a little bit better here. So this is a 1s, right? This is a n equals 1, l equals 0, m sub l equals 0. There's only one m sub l value, so there's only one 1s orbital. That's the n equals 1 shell. Very simple, one orbital. Yeah. Well, um, they can't all be in the same spot, okay? And that's what happened with the solution of this equation, frankly, is you end up with a series of, of states, of wave functions, of orbitals, where um, they have different energies. So they're not all going to have the same energy because the electron can be different distances from the nucleus. And this one here is at a higher energy, that means it would be bigger because it means the electron spends more time further from the nucleus. So, you know, we're not talking about where, in hydrogen, you only have one electron. So hydrogen and its ground state will be in the 1s orbital. But if you come in with light, you're gonna take that and put it into a higher energy orbital. And those would be these bigger, or orbitals just because larger means further from the nucleus means higher energy. That's really all I can tell you about that, really. What? Well, what, actually for N equals one, you can't have L equals one, um, but um, why, you know, honestly, uh, it's the theory. You solve that equation. These numbers come right out of the theory. You can't get solutions. It, it's, it's a long story and it's really beyond your scope in this course. I mean, I've taught this many times in physical chemistry too. And I mean, it's just, uh, it just happens that way. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of out there. So there's a couple of things I do want to say about this. So so here we have the n equals two shell, and here's our l equals zero, our two s orbital. Okay, this was the one s, and, and and so you could see that there is different. You know, the electron can be found in all of these different places here, 
But where it's most likely to be found is where there are more spots. So the density of dots in this picture kind of reflects the, you know, where you're more likely to find the electron. But one thing I want to point out is so it's probably most likely to find the electron like right here. Well, it's really around the same distance from the nucleus as where you would find these p electrons as well. The most likely place is about the same distance from the nucleus as in the 2s. And in fact, the 2p and the 2s have the same energy for a one electron atom. because its E is only a function of N. If, so in other words, for hydrogen, if you take an electron out of the 1S and you put it in the 2S, it'll have a higher energy. But if you took that electron out of the 1S and put it in the 2P, it has the same energy as if it was put in the 2S. So energy is a function of N only. So now we have these three 2P orbitals. So now we have N equals two and L equals one, and we have M sub L being negative one, zero, and positive one. And I, I've just sort of arbitrarily assigned those numbers to those orbitals. You don't have to, doesn't matter which is which, but what you know, what you see here is that you have three different values of this M sub L, and that means that you have three orbitals in the 2P, okay? So the number of M sub L values gives you the number of orbitals in that subshell. Yeah. Um, no, but that's also beyond the scope of, of us here in general chemistry. Some transitions are allowed, some are not allowed by quantum mechanics. And it's a long story. So now we have the N equals three and L equals zero. That's the three S. And now we have the N equals three and L equals one, that's the three P. There are again, three M sub L values. I don't care which is which, but the three M sub L values mean three two P orbitals. And so there's three orbitals in the P subshell. And now we have N equals three L equals two, and we have five different M sub L values, two, one, zero, negative one, negative two. I don't know which is which. I'm not expecting you to know. I'm just saying the fact that there are five M sub L values means there are five D orbitals in the, in the D subshell of the N equals three shell. All right, I know, this is really fun, isn't it? <laughs> um, all right, so I just want you to notice a few things about these quantum numbers um, and, and sort of their relationships with each other, all right? So N, one, two, three, this is a uh, an integer that's greater than zero. That's where it starts, and then you just add one each time. So that's the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is that L starts with zero, right? It doesn't start with one. L equals zero is an orbital. And it never reaches the value of N, right? So for example, for the N equals one shell, you have L equals zero and that's it. Um, so L starts with zero and goes up to N minus one. So for the N equals one shell, you only have L equals zero. For the N equals two shell, you have L equals zero and L equals one. For the N equals three shell, you have three different values. But notice the two is still less than three. So L is always less than N. Doesn't ever get up to N. Um, and the third thing is that the number of M sub L values for a given L subshell gives 
the number of orbitals in that subshell. So if you have L equals zero, it means you only have M sub L can be only zero. It starts with negative L and it goes up to L, adding one each time. You can only have zero. Yeah. Does this mean that like Shells. Yeah, yeah. Actually, as you go down the periodic table, you're adding an you're adding shells. The first, um, what well, we're going to do that, yeah. But the first uh, period is filling the n equals one shell. The second period is filling the n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, etc. Okay. Um, for l equals is s p for l equals one m sub l is negative one, zero, one. So there's three orbitals in the P subshell. D, again, I've told you this already, but just minus one, zero, one, two. So there's five. Okay, this is just giving the number of orbitals. Okay, so this is all very, uh, you know, <laughs> not that much fun, but I wanna show you some sort of close-up pictures of some of these orbitals and talk a little bit more about their characteristics. So if we go ahead and look at some of the slides that I gave you, um, this is like a close-up picture of an S orbital. And a lot of times in books, you actually see a sphere like this for an S orbital. But I'm just, what that sphere actually is, so what this circle is here, is it, it's enclosing the sort of 90% probability region of where you would find that electron. The reason it's a sphere is because the probability doesn't depend on angle. It's the same at any angle. That is characteristic of an S orbital. Um, so the, the, like I said, this is really like the 90% probability sort of circle or, or, uh, or it's actually a sphere, but um, so 90% of the probability of where the electron is found is within that circle. Like if you see it as a sphere, but really what's happening is that the probability is highest in the middle and then it goes down as the distance to the nucleus um, increases. So that's, um, that's a one S. Now, this, these guys are a little more complicated. And what I'm showing here, this is a 2s and a 3s, and I'm blowing them up, right? So the dotted lines is just blowing up the orbital and taking a close look, a cross section of that orbital. And now what you see in there is a region that looks white. And what that is, is a node. This is a region of zero probability of finding the electron. And just like when you pluck the guitar string and you have a, something that just boings up and down attached at the ends, but when you have these harmonics, you can have nodes in the middle, places that do not move. And as you go to higher and higher harmonics, as you go to higher and higher states here, you have more and more nodes so that a 3s orbital has zero probability in two different rings around the nucleus. And those are the white regions that you see here. So the white means zero probability. Those are nodes. Okay, so there's some special characteristics. As you go up in energy, you have more of these nodes. Okay, um, I'm showing you there are different ways of representing p orbitals as well. You can use the dots to show the probability distribution of where an electron might be found in a p orbital, but most of the time, this is what you see is the dumbbell shape, okay? And this has more of an angular dependence, right? An electron can't be at this angle. It could be at this angle or this angle from the nucleus, but it can't be there. So there's more of an angular dependence for p orbitals. Um, 
D orbitals, it gets more and more complicated. These, there's more and more lobes. There's very complicated angular dependencies of where that electron can be. You don't need to know these, what they look like. I mean, you need to know there's five of them and maybe recognize them, but you certainly don't need to know which is DYZ, DXZ, you know, all these names. I don't care for you to know that. It's not important. Um, but there are more lobes as you get to higher and higher um, values of L, right? This is L equals two. So there's five of them. Um, and this is a picture I just threw in for fun. <laughs> These are F orbitals. So F is L equals three. So what shell would you start seeing F orbitals in, right? Remember that L is always less than N, right? So you would have to be in the N equals four shell to start seeing F orbitals, okay? So, um, so these are very complicated and you certainly don't have to know what they look like, um, but, but they are, you know, you could know that there's more, they're more complicated. Um, and that's the highest I'm gonna show you, but I, but I, you know that when you um, think about atoms, a lot of times the way atoms are represented is as a sphere. I mean, given the fact that you have all these crazy shapes of crazy orbitals, how is it that we think of an atom as a sphere? And so I love this picture because what it does is it takes all of these orbitals and it kind of puts them all together. And in, in multi-electron atoms, you'll have many, many of these orbitals are going to be occupied with electrons. And if you put all the orbitals together, they kind of look like a sphere. So uh, that's why I put them all together because they're, you know, there's lots of different ones. And, um, and so it is kind of spherical. Anyway. Okay. So we're almost done with quantum numbers, but there's another quantum number that we need before we start filling um, well, before we can talk about, um, before we could talk about uh, atoms that have more than one electron, which is most of them. So this, this, this X is fourth quantum number is called the electron spin. <laughs> I am personally very attached to the fourth quantum number because believe it or not, I did my PhD thesis on electron spin spectroscopy. So, um, but anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a little thing. This electron spin quantum number is called M subscript S, okay? And here's, here's, the, here's the, the, the talk, all right? This is an axis. And if you have an electron, it's rotating on an axis. And it could either rotate counterclockwise. Guess what the other one is? <laughs> or clockwise. And when it does that, it generates a tiny little magnetic field because a spinning electron does generate a magnetic field. However, if it's spinning one way, it generates a little magnetic field in one direction. And if it's spinning the other way, it generates a little magnetic field in the other direction. This is, by the way, um, this same thing happens with nuclei and nuclear um, spin quantum numbers. That's all about MRI. MRI is based on transitions of nuclear spins, flipping from the spin up to spin down. Anyway, we call this thing here, these different, the fact that this spinning electron produces a magnetic field going up, we, we say that M sub S is plus one half. And when it's, we call this spin up, we call this spin down, and this M sub S is minus one half. And that's really all there is to know for us about the spin quantum number. But there's something else 
which restricts the quantum numbers that electrons can have. And it's called the Pauli exclusion principle, which I'm spelling wrong. Come on. <laughs> And this principle says that no two electrons in any atom, uh, uh, in any orbital, sorry, can have the same four quantum numbers. All right, so let's think about what this consequence of this would be. So what is the consequence of this? So when you have an orbital, let's say the 2s orbital, okay? That means that n equals two, l equals zero, and m sub l equals zero. Every orbital is characterized by three quantum numbers. Okay, so three quantum numbers, the N, the L, and the M sub L characterize an orbital. So the Pauli principle says no two electrons in any orbital can have the same four quantum numbers. But if they're in the same orbital, they already have three quantum numbers that are the same right? Because they're in the same orbital. So they have the same L, N, and M sub L. So what it means, this Pauli principle, is that if you have two electrons in an orbital, they must have opposite spins. One must be one half and the other must be negative a half. We say those spins are paired, okay? So since an orbital set specifies three quantum numbers, the fourth must be different if, you, if they're in the same orbital. And so it leads to the fact that you can have only two electrons in any orbital. And they must have spins plus one half and negative one half, okay? So, so while this sounds all very complicated, it leads to some pretty simple conclusion. And that is you can only have two electrons in every orbital and they have to have opposite spins. So if I go to figure out the number of electrons that can fit in each shell in an atom that has many electrons. Let's go and talk about the n equals one shell. Okay, so, so for the n equals one shell, let's write down n, l, m sub l, and m sub s for electrons in that shell. So, we know that N would be one because we're in the N equals one shell. L can only be zero, right? This has to be an S type orbital. What's the M sub L value have to be? It starts at negative L, right? Negative zero, it's just zero. And we could have one electron would be plus one half. And our second electron would be negative one half. So these are the only sets of quantum numbers that are possible for electrons in the n equals one shell. There's only one subshell. It's the s or l equals zero subshell. And there are only two electrons here, two electrons in the 1s, two electrons in the n equals one shell. Well, we could go through helium. Hydrogen, helium is the next one. Helium would have two electrons in the 1s. Okay, let's do the n equals two shell. 
So what do I put here for N? Two. And now there are two different L values that you can have here. What's the first one? Zero. And the M sub L would be for L equals zero. Zero. So what does M sub S have to be? Well, we could have two electrons and one would have one half and one would have negative a half. So that would be the two electrons in the S subshell of the N equals two shell. Okay, but there's another subshell, right? What else could I put for L here? One, okay, and I could have M sub L as Negative one. What else could it and, and and I could have one half and negative one half. And this is now a the p subshell because l equals one, so this is a p. So this is the two p. So I have, but I have three different orbitals, right? I've got the dumbbell this way, the dumbbell this way, and the dumbbell this way. I have three different M sub L values. What are the other values of M sub L that are possible? You start, don't forget, you start with negative L. So negative one, add one, zero, until you get to positive L, right? So negative one, zero, and positive one. So, so what could I give the spin number here? Spin up. And I could do the same thing, spin down. <laughs> it's got Greek, right? <laughs> I know, it's totally insane. But I could also, with L equals one, have positive one as my M sub L. So this is now the third of the three dumbbell-shaped orbitals. And so I see here that I have six electrons in the P subshell of the N equals two shell. So if you add up the two and the six, you get that you have eight electrons in the N equals two shell. Okay. So now I'd like you to take out activity two from the packet that I just gave you is at the end of all the slides. And I'd like you to work out that N equals three shell, okay? Because if I do it, it doesn't teach you anything. So we have the N equals three one here. So just use the same strategy. Go and look at what was done for the previous one, the N equals two. You'll start with the S subshell and then the P subshell, right? So the S subshell will have L equals zero. Then you'll have the P subshell, L equals one. And then here you have the D subshell, L equals two. Okay, and so this way you'll figure out how many electrons can fit in the N equals three subshell, okay? And when you're done, I'd like you to write your name on top and hand this in as a handout of the day, okay?
Oh, I have a typo in here. Should be P. <laughs> Correct that. D should be P. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, 
Wow, really? That's so cool. I want to visit there. Oh, okay. I 
another problem session. I have one Friday at 10, but I could do a different one. I wanted to do one today and I forgot to announce it. I don't know. Damn. <laughs> when do you want to do it? What time? Okay. But I can only stay like an hour. That's fine. All right. Come to my office. You probably need to yeah, because no one. <laughs> I wanted to uh, like my gotcha. Oh yeah, right. Well, I forget. Yeah, everyone always forgets. Right. I'm sorry, better walk. Yeah. Don't tell me. Give me a hint. What? Andrew. Right. Yeah. And what's your last name? Barbie. Barbie. Oh, yeah. Hold on. It's 10. Hold on. No, I should have done this. How did I get a lab? You got to go to lab. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Good. Oh, you you would need that. Where is everyone? Oh, here. Great. Thank you, professor. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what's happening to this class. It's out of control. Somebody when, left it. Uh, I don't know. Quantum mechanics is that. Um, physics. I feel like I've I've heard of that. Oh, so sure. The Marvel movie. Probably. Oh, come on! It was all over Oppenheimer and. Probably Ant Man. Oh, pop! Yes, it's it's very fashionable to talk about quantum mechanics, in in those things. Yeah. And I some of those things called Clark. Oh, Clark. War, uh, oh, Clark. Quarks. That's not. That's like string theory. That's like part. Uh, that part. I don't know because I remember that's high energy physics, oh, which involves quantum mechanics and lots of other things. 
I don't know. <laughs> don't know quite how that went, but that's what it is. Section of the quiz room. Yeah, I like my jacket on something. It's fair. Does he have a line or a line? Why does he want to go to your office? I'll get there. Actually, there's a class in here, so I do have to clean this up. Wow. Thank you. 